video tak ki dita am i audible am i visible I will start at after two two minutes, I think. Fine, fine. Thank you. I get your comments all that I am visible and audible. Uh, so I think I should uh, begin now. It's almost uh, three thirty. Two minutes, in fact, to go. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my dear students, colleagues, friends. uh those of you who are who attended uh, my last uh, class actually it was basically meant as a class uh must remember that uh uh i talked about one of the essays in the volume imaginary homelands and i explained uh certain concepts specifically the concept of the homeland as seen from the diaspora and uh, we had some discussions as well uh i will today go to another essay in the same volume the earlier was written in 1982 that particular essay although the book was published in 1991 the essay was particular essay was published in 1982 this essay is published in it was published in 1983 and the title of the essay is very interesting commonwealth literature does not exist it's a kind of a statement a, a very very emphatic, emphatic statement i will come to that but before that i i must uh, uh observe that this particular essay which is also a very important essay in the volume uh should be approached i think from historical point of view which is very important i think as well as from the point, point of view of cultural politics politics of culture so while discussing the essay and i am sure the students have already gone through it i probably mentioned it in my last class that i shall take up this essay so i mentioned that uh, we shall approach this particular essay from two perspectives number one historical and number two uh, politics of culture what do i mean by the first point historical perspective 
please remember that it was written in 1983 or uh, a little less than 40 years before much has changed in the meantime as I maintained in my last class as well so so you see what was the politics at that time what was the kind of uh, 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 nomenclatures what are the kind of literary works that we had to study at that time I also would like to uh, uh, make a kind of an observation as a witness because I was a student at that time 1970s uh, basically and then in 1980 when I joined my profession this was a very important time from the point of view of post-colonial literatures. You see that at that time we came across this particular nomenclature which is commonwealth literature. Now right now I don't think you have to come across this particular nomenclature very often. I don't think so. Although you must have come across the particular nomenclature, you know that it existed. Today it is mainly replaced by a new nomenclature, post-colonial literature. But then <clears throat> you know that uh, these two were not the only nomenclatures that we come across. There, was, there were some other uh, nomenclatures as well one of which was new literatures. Uh, therefore, when you read the essay, please remember that it was written in the 1980s when the canons were being reformed and reshaped. And new canons were taking place. At that time, the basic thrust in India as elsewhere in the other colonies was basically going against the British norms. British literature was very much there. It was not replaced. But then British literature was also being threatened from the literatures produced from the margins. And that is why later you know that we, we started uh, uh, articulating things like uh, empires rights back or something like that. So it is basically this communal literature is basically about the empire and the politics of the empire. So if you remember this uh, historical perspective that it was a juncture when literary works were being produced and they were forming into a mass of literary works, these works from, came from not only India but all other uh, uh, peripheries, all other peripheries of the British Empire from Africa, from the Caribbean islands, from Australia. So you see that you can see, you can note certain amount of politics which, is, which was invested in the term itself. You know that uh, nomenclature is also an expression of power. Uh, it depends on who is giving the nomenclature. Naming is a power, is an act of power, is an exercise of power. And therefore, don't uh, literary nomenclatures innocently. And uh, therein lies the culture, the politics of culture the politics of literary culture. So from that point of view, you know that it was obviously created by the, the uh, uh, agents of English literature and uh, confronted with the growing surge of literary works from the margin, from the erstwhile colonies, they felt that they should categorize, they should come up with new categorization. They were facing problems, problems like the questions came like, should we incorporate these literary works 
uh, from the margin, produced from the margin, produced from India, Caribbean islands, different countries of Africa. And therefore they were in a dilemma. And Commonwealth, this very nomenclature, Commonwealth literature was floated. As you know that originally the term was British uh, Commonwealth. Uh, British Commonwealth was originally founded in 1931 and it was a political idea. There were some countries like Australia, New Zealand, uh, South Africa who, who actually pledged their loyalty and allegiance to the British crown. It was in 1931, very much a political idea. And uh, then you see in 1949, uh, it was expanded. The term was expanded to include many more countries. And uh, interestingly there, the word British was dropped. Okay? So British, lit British Commonwealth became Commonwealth. And later on towards at the end of 1960s and uh, beginning of 1970s, the term uh, Commonwealth literature came into prominence. Okay? When we were students, uh, we, we came across it, we discussed it, although we didn't read much of the Commonwealth literature. But works were coming up. For example, there were anthologies, one by Narasimhaya, Professor Narasimhaya himself. So there were anthologies which were being produced. There were other kinds of writings. So please also remember that Commonwealth literature came into being. So you find a kind of contradiction between the title of the present essay, which is Commonwealth literature does not exist. On the whole, if you see it from historical points of view, we'll find that Commonwealth literature existed. For us, therefore, the question is when at a given historical point Commonwealth literature did really exist, why is it that Ruzdi, writing in 1983, say that the Commonwealth literature does not exist? I would, I would, uh, write, I would like to respond to this question uh, like this, that it was also an act, a radical act of politics, cultural politics. Okay? Uh, Ruzdi was in fact involved in a kind of contestation of the term. Not only the attitude of the British literature, not only the attitude of the persons uh, who advocated the superiority of British literature, but he was also trying to point out that the kind of nomenclature that they actually produced or floated is not acceptable. And how can that be said? The best way to say this, a clear, to make a clear radical statement. What is the statement? Commonwealth literature does not exist. So when the British Empire and its agents cannot see the uh, literature produced from the different post-colonial countries, that is a kind of a politics when they cannot see. So on our part also we should strike back and we should say that British uh, common literature does not exist. Something that is a creation of the British themselves uh, is nothing more than a fantasy, a kind of a chimera. Both these words, fantasy, and Chimera uh, have been used by Salman Rushdie in the essay itself. Okay? So this is nothing but this essay is actually an exercise of cultural politics. Herein comes the second point. Okay? And uh, when, you, when you go to the text itself, you will find that the text begins from a personal point of view. Uh, Ruzdi says that he was to join a, a conference uh, which will be held in uh, Sweden and uh, the conference title is obviously the, the discourses will be on Commonwealth literature 
where uh, people from writers from different countries including Africa, India, uh, Caribbean islands uh, and uh, even people who, who were uh, Africans or Indians who lived in the UK, they also participated. And uh, in this context, he, he uh, uh, listened to everybody's uh, lectures and he had interactions also. He, were, he had the knowledge of earlier discourses in the form of uh, interviews, in the form of other kinds of writings. And he says that uh, uh, most of the writers from the so-called periphery do not actually agree with the spirit of the term. They do not accept the term. Okay? And therefore, you see, that uh, the term itself is a contested one. So contestation started even before that. But then Rusdi was probably the first person to make a very clear statement where he radically makes a statement that Commonwealth literature does not actually exist. Now, you see that uh, he mentions a lady who was part of the organizing committee uh, he, she assured Ruzdi that, okay, you are here to attend Commonwealth literature, but then uh, you may be rest assured that uh, Commonwealth literature is part of the English, English literature. Now, you see uh, that there is a confession that uh, you cannot deny this growing corpus of literature but then, even then, there is a certain kind of distance, okay? A distance between the English literature proper, written by white Englishmen, and the other kinds of literature produced in English, which are not written by, or which were not written by, the white British people. So, there was a kind of a hierarchy, okay? Uh, and Rusty raises the question, why is it that uh, English should not be, English literature should not be included in the Commonwealth literature. English literature was not usually, in fact, it was not included in the nomenclature itself. So what is the politics about that? He, he raises the question. And uh, he raises certain other questions about, for example, American literature. America was also a kind of a colony. Okay. But American literature is not included in uh, uh, this particular nomenclature. Although uh, North American literature in the sense of Canadian literature was included in it. Australian literature was included in it. Uh, these were settler colonies. So why is it that British literature which forms the nucleus of this formation? Uh, it was originally British Commonwealth. Okay? And therefore, British was Britain was the uh, nucleus. It was the center. So, why is it that the center opts out? What is the politics in it? So, therefore, you see, the politics must be very seen very clearly. And Rusty uh, ultimately foregrounds this politics by pointing out that British literature does not include itself in the nomenclature simply because it does not want to equate itself with other kinds of writing, uh, with, with uh, literature produced in other countries written by non-British writers. So you see that it is a kind of an act of isolation. It, uh, British literature isolates itself from the other literatures which was directly the product of colonialism, which were produced because English was introduced in the curricula of different countries they conquered and therefore ultimately the people who, who actually learned English and ultimately started producing literatures written in English. So is it that uh, Ruzdi uh, probably uh, suggests that uh, uh, there is an attempt to create a kind of binary between 
British literature on the one hand and other literatures written in English on the other hand. So he says this is nothing but an act of creation of a kind of a hierarchy. Okay. So from this point he then comes to uh, uh, the term itself. There are a uh, very interesting uh, point uh, that he makes pointing out to this division, division between uh, British literature and commonwealth literature uh, which usually does not include British literature, English literature. He says that you see there is a kind of world going on between these two mates or two sides. Okay? And he uses certain phrases which are very interesting and I would like to uh, uh, point out the uh, phrases that he uses. What are this? For example, he says that uh, commonal literature and British literature are like squabbling children, children who are quarreling. Okay? They are not compatible. So they, sh they should be separated. Then uh, very interestingly, uh, pointing out the possibilities of union, negating the possibilities of union in fact, uh, he says that these two parties or partners are like sexually incompatible pandas. Okay? So you see that they cannot get into a kind of uh, union and communion simply because there is a uh, 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 gradation between these two partners and they are not uh, 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 compatible. Okay? So communication cannot take properly. Okay? So communion cannot take place properly. Then another very interesting uh, uh, metaphor that he uses in this respect is that uh, they are unstable fissile materials whose union might cause explosions. These are the two components when the two come together there will be a kind of explosion. Okay? So they cannot be met, they cannot uh, meet in any kind of union. Uh, then you see that uh, uh, he, he says that because of these kinds of uh, this this kind of an attitude, they are kept separate. Okay, and uh, he says the politics was that ultimately uh, they should be uh, uh, there should be a ghetto mentality. Uh, last time I also mentioned uh, the uh, about uh, Salman Rushdie's uh, idea about ghetto, particularly cultural ghetto. When, was, when he speaks of the diasporic community, he was against any kind of ghetto mentality. Okay? Here also, he is against any kind of ghetto mentality. Uh, the basic politics he points out is that the, uh, this commonwealth literature is created because they should be put into all these literary works should be put into a kind of a ghetto and they should not transcend beyond that. So they are put within a very, very, uh, 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 very, very limited perspective. They are bounded by certain kind of uh, boundaries and mostly these boundaries are national boundaries. Okay? For example, example, when you say Indian literature, Indian literature at that point of time was not fully formed in the international terminology but then it was visible, quite visible and when you say Indian literature you cannot transcend the boundary of nationality. You are Indian and you should be authenticated Indian, you should be authentically Indian and therefore you see when you are an Australian, you should be authentically an Australian. When you are an African, you should be authentically an African. So when you uh, speak of authentic, the word authentic, 
it wants to keep within the purview of a limited boundary you cannot cross that kind of a boundary this is a politics which is very much invested in the term uh, uh, you see commonwealth literature commonwealth literature is used as a loose kind of formation where there are many literatures but they are ghettos of some kinds and there are many points of intersections but there are many differences as well but whether there are points of intersections or whether there are points of inter uh, differences they can be put within a box which can be called uh, commonwealth literature so you see that it is a kind of a ghettoization an exclusive ghettoization and this is something which is protested contested by Salman Rushdie. He says that the word is a, a model. Okay? It, it is a production of model-headed persons. It does not mean anything. He says that it is a chimera. When he uh, refers to the metaphor of chimera, he refers to obviously the, the uh, classical mythological figure of the chimera uh, which is formed of different animals, tails of a snake, for example, or head of some animal, or body of some other animal. So, this kind of a creation, a commonwealth, he says, is, is a chimera because it is, a, it is composed of different bodies, which are separate bodies, which can come together. But then, when you form them together into a box, keeping them in a ghetto, what happens is that you, you create a body which is uh, uh, comparable to a chimera. Chimera is a fantasy. And therefore, chimera is an unreality. So the term is itself an unreal term. Okay? Therefore, you see, the term should not be accepted. So in the... I am not going into particular parts of the uh, uh, text because within the time, uh, probably we have almost uh, spent uh, 45 minutes or 50 minutes. I am not going into the text, but these are the basic arguments. I am placing these arguments against a broader background, theoretical and historical background. Uh, and uh, uh, he says that uh, this phantom should therefore be immediately rejected. He says that this is a new and badly made umbrella. This umbrella does not stand the scrutiny. He says that uh, he questions actually uh, a person who met, who met and who said who, who actually talked about the advantages of a term like commonwealth literature a person who said who spoke of a kind of liberty, a certain advantages, certain advantages in occupying a position on the periphery. He met somebody from the Commonwealth countries, and that person, who is a boss, and uh, uh, Rusdi terms him as a kind of a don, okay, academic don. That don said that there are certain advantages of uh, occupying uh, the position of the periphery. So when you see that when he mentions this, very interestingly, he points out that there are persons who want to uh, reap some advantages from the term and the politics, the actual material politics from it. For example, you see that uh, this is something, a kind of a uh, thing, uh, uh, a common literature prize, for example. Okay, people compete for Commonwealth Literature Prize. Okay, and if you win the Commonwealth Literature Prize, if there is an award in the name of Commonwealth and you win it, your prestige is immensely increased and inflated. You are full of ego. So there are temptations obviously extended from the center and the periphery accepts this kind of uh, temptations and unproblematically of course without going into details and therefore uh, accepting or being trapped in the uh, politics 
itself. Uh, therefore, he, he says that uh, uh, Commonwealth literature, the term is the very oddest of beasts. He, when he say, uses the term beast, he obviously actually refers to the chimera, okay, and uh, the, uh, which which ex which can exist only in uh, 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 cannot exist in reality, but only in fantasy, in fiction. So therefore, you see that the term itself, right from the beginning, is bogged in controversy. And he says that some countries which should be included in the Commonwealth, Commonwealth uh, nomenclature is not included. For example, the centre itself, the British literature itself. Uh, uh, for example, you see uh, uh, South Africa is not at that point of time not included in it. It opted out. Pakistan opted out. So these are very, very important kind of uh, uh, statements that he made and from that point of view you see that uh, communal literature came for very much uh, 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 criticism from him. He uh, defines communal literature in the following way and I, I quote him. Commonwealth literature, it appears, is that body of writing created, I think, in the English language by persons who are not themselves white Britons or Irish or citizens or the United States of America. You, you see that how he defines the term itself. And uh, then he points out that uh, uh, even with the even dispensing with the term, we can accept the ac accept the reality that already in the meantime there is a there has been a wide range of literary works coming of coming from different countries, and therefore you see uh, there is a certain advantage in it, and it says that. In literary works, a lot of experimentations are going on. F uh, for example, Rusty himself was reshaping the language, reshaping the literary works, and there are many other writers also who did not write like the Englishmen, who wrote like Indians or the Africans. You have gone through the literary works of Chinua Achibi or Ongugyo Watiango you will find how the language is reshaped in radically different way and English, English language, the English language is appropriated in their own indigenous multiple forms. So he is against the linguist, linguistic politics uh, that often plagues uh, uh, in different, uh, plagues the literary scenario, the cultural scenario in different places. For example, he mentions India, where there was at the time a politics of imposing Hindi on uh, as a all Indian language, as an all India language, and uh, the south of India was vehemently against it. There were, they actually rose against the center and they ultimately uh, they did not accept the proposal that Hindi should be taken as the national language. So you see that he is against any kind of linguistic imperialism, but he also accepts the fact that Ingle English has become an Indian language or uh, an African language for that matter. And it is very much uh, a, a part of the nation themselves. But then when he says nation, he doesn't uh, mean to limit itself, the literary works themselves, to the nation itself. And therefore, he speaks in favor of internationalization of literary works, Indian literature, for example, or African literatures or Caribbean literatures, for example. And this inter internationalization of literature goes against the very grain of uh, ghettoization. So it is an anti-ghetto kind of action which we should all resort to. So uh, this is how you see that 
uh, he he reacts against the very term and uh, uh, the very term itself is uh, uh, what is at the center of the essay itself but then he for a, for a quite some time he uh, he sp speaks about the indian condition i am not going into the condition uh, because it will take a quite a uh, quite some time instead of that i will mention i will read out from uh, s s some lines for example you will perhaps have noticed that the purpose of this literary ghetto like that of all ghettos perhaps is to confine to restrain its rules are basically conservative tradition is all radical breaches with the past are frowned which the pasts are i'm sorry with the past are frowned upon so here in he brings in the concept of authenticity and he says that the concept of authenticity for example is also floated for political reasons if you say that this particular work is not authentically indian then what you point out what you want to point out is that this is not indian enough by which he means that a particular work is sought to be tied down to a particular nomenclature only which is national and therefore you are being stopped from going beyond that and you see that uh, Uh, there were earlier critics many critics who talked about the nationalism and nationality in this sense in this particular smaller restrictive sense and uh, rusdi is very much against this kind of uh, limitization limitation of the terms so you see that authentication is something that he frowns upon and uh, he says that there are this authentication is in fact he says that uh, authentication or authenticity is something which is a new form of exoticization this is also very interesting comment that he makes okay so what you call as indian literature very specifically indian literature it should resort to indianness and you are very much aware that there were a lot of writings which uh, lots of discourses which speak of uh, indianness narasimhaya is one critic for example uh, besides others who has written about indianness so you see the the this is according to narasim uh, according to rusdi is something which is an attempt to limit a national literature to the nation itself and which is against the very grain of internationalization and uh, he points out that uh, the main uh, 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 the main works are being written from the periphery and in this respect i would since our time is almost up uh, i would mention one thing very interesting thing he says that when we mention commonwealth literature we refer to only the literary works written in english and not in the regional languages for bengali for english or swahili or any other language for that matter so so commonwealth literature is exclusively written in english why is it why is it be, should be should it be so and interestingly in this respect he mentions that ongogi uh, vathyango in that swedish seminar Uh, in which uh, uh, Rusdi was very much present, uh, read his paper uh, in Swahili language, which was translated by one someone else, 
and nobody else understood when Swahili, Swahili was being actually read out. The language was being Swahili read out. So very interestingly, you see, in this respect, uh, he says that in regional languages of India, a lot of works are being produced at that very historical points of time. So these should also be taken care of. The Bhasha literatures, the literatures produced in the regional languages, these are important as well. And therefore, why is it, what is the politics of excluding these literatures? Now, when you compare the stand of uh, Ruzdi given, at the given time in 1983, you will realize, you, you remember, you might remember that the same Ruzdi much later in an introduction to an anthology uh, mentioned that not much works are being produced in India in the regional languages, in the Bhasha literatures, whatever important works are being produced or, or were being produced at the given point of time were written in English. So you see there are contradictions in Ruzdi himself as well. But the basic point that he makes is that the ghettoization, these terms which are meant for ghettoizing a particular literary product in order to create a kind of hierarchy, that should be blasted, the politics should be blasted. And you should bring various features of various literary works, including their points of intersections and their points of diversifications, their points of divergences. All this should be brought up, foregrounded, and at that given point of time, he says that perhaps this should be theorized, which it had been done. As we all know, that we have already know of a good number of works, discursive works, which talked about the intersections and the divergences. Okay, I will uh, therefore uh, finish. Uh, wind up today's lecture, uh, make coming back to the politics that I spoke about and I will uh, read a bit from Salman Rushdie. Uh, he says towards the end of the essay and I read, quote him, it strikes me that my title may not really be accurate. What is the title? Commonwealth literature does not exist, a kind of a radical politics that I mentioned. Uh, then it goes on, there is clearly such a thing as Commonwealth literature. So here he admits that there is something which is called Commonwealth literature. Then why does he say that it does not uh, exist? Then. How does he, why does he say that communal literature exists really? Because even ghosts can be made to exist. Very important line. Even ghosts can be made to exist. Okay? Ghosts can be made to exist through representation. Okay? Ghosts can be made to exist through machinations. Ghosts can be, ghosts something does not really exist but which are shadows of ideas, they can be brought, they can be materialized through political acts, through your resources, either they may be, these resources may be financial or infrastructural. This can be made to exist through creation of English departments, through creation of syllabus or syllabi, through creations, through, through, through publications of primary and secondary sources, primary books which are being produced, literary works which were there, but also the secondary works which can be produced through academic efforts and they can be assorted and organized into different kind of departments like the Department of English 
and that is why please remember that ongi ongugi was so much against the persistence of english in his own country and he favored the concept of reading world literature through the indigenous ma- uh, uh, medium through the regional languages and he was in favor of abolition of the english departments that is very wonderful okay and that is what he says that a ghost can be made to exist through different kind of political maneuvers if you write enough books and appoint enough research students and of course pr- professors it does not exist in the sense that writers do not write it but that is of minor importance so perhaps i should rephrase myself commonwealth literature should not exist so he comes to the conclusion after beginning in a radical fashion and achieving his purpose of blasting the politics of floating a term like commonwealth literature he comes to the conclusion and says that there is indeed there is made to a, a communal literature is made to exist and therefore i should rephrase my title and i should say that commonwealth literature should not exist it should not exist because it fosters ghetto mentality it should not exist because it it speaks of national boundary and favors that one should not go beyond that it it speaks against internationalization okay there are many reasons like that and then he uh, uh, comes to a kind of concluding summing up kind of uh, statement and i am reading this statement i think that if all english literatures should be studied together a shape would emerge which would truly reflect the new shape of the language in the world and we should see that inlit has never been in better shape he says that english language through transformation is has come to a wonderful shape right at the moment right now and it is producing literary works uh, which are wonderful which uh, actually catches attention of the it catches global attention because the world language now also possesses a world literature which is proliferating in every conceivable direction here comes another nomenclature which is world literature which is also very much in currency right now and world literature is being uh, uh, very much supported in countries like the us right now and then he the uh, ultimate ultimately the last uh, uh, concluding paragraph is like this the english language ceased to be the sole possession of the english some time ago perhaps commonwealth literature was invented to delay the debt when we rough beasts actually slouch into bethlehem in which case it's time to admit that center cannot hold so he comes to the conclusion that the politics was obviously were a politics of delay to delaying the ultimate emergence of the true talents scattered all over the world who are writing mainly in english but there are many other writings which can be translated from the regional languages into english and other languages as well so his attitude is a global attitude his attitude is an internationalist attitude so you see that this is a very important again a canonical essay which attempts at re reevaluation of the english canon and ultimately its purpose is to blast the political act of creating uh, a very very regressive nomenclatures like 
the commonwealth literature thank you very much thank you so i stop here thank thanks everybody